Lord of the Flies by William Golding Chapter 1 The Sound of the Shell The boy with fair hair lowered himself down the last few feet of rock and began to pick his way towards the lagoon. Though he had taken off his school sweater and trailed it now from one hand, his grey shirt stuck to him and his hair was plastered to his forehead. All round him the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bath of heat. He was clambering heavily among the creepers and broken trunks when a bird, a vision of red and yellow, flashed upwards with a witch-like cry. And this cry was echoed by another. Hi, it said. Wait a minute. The undergrowth at the side of the scar was shaken, and a multitude of raindrops fell pattering. Wait a minute, the voice said. I got caught up. The fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem, for a moment, like the home counties. The voice spoke again. I can't hardly move with all these creeper things. The owner of the voice came backing out of the undergrowth so that twigs scratched on a greasy windbreaker. The naked crooks of his knees were plump, caught and scratched by thorns. He bent down, removed the thorns carefully, and turned round. He was shorter than the fair boy, and very fat. He came forward searching out safe lodgments for his feet, and then looked up through thick spectacles. Where's the man with the megaphone? The fair boy shook his head. This is an island. At least I think it's an island. There's a reef out in the sea. Perhaps there aren't any grown-ups anywhere. The fat boy looked startled. There was that pilot. But he wasn't in the passenger tube. He was up in the cabin in front. The fair boy was peering at the reef through screwed-up eyes. All them other kids, the fat boy went on. Some of them must have got out. They must have, mustn't they? The fair boy began to pick his way as casually as possible towards the water. He tried to be offhand and not too obviously uninterested, but the fat boy hurried after him. Aren't there any grown-ups at all? I don't think so. The fair boy said this solemnly, but then the delight of a realised ambition overcame him. In the middle of the scar he stood on his head and grinned at the reversed fat boy. No grown-ups! The fat boy thought for a moment. That pilot! The fair boy allowed his feet to come down and sat on the steamy earth. He must have flown off after he dropped us. He couldn't land here. Not in a plane with wheels. We was attacked! He'll be back all right. The fat boy shook his head. When we was coming down, I looked through one of them windows. I saw the other part of the plane. There were flames coming out of it. He looked up and down the scar. And this is what the tube done. The fair boy reached out and touched the jagged end of a trunk. For a moment, he looked interested. What happened to it? he asked. Where's it got to now? That storm dragged it out to sea. It wasn't half dangerous with all them tree trunks falling. There must have been some kids still in it. He hesitated for a moment, then spoke again. What's your name? Ralph. The fat boy waited to be asked his name in turn, but this proffer of acquaintance was not made. The fair boy called Ralph, smiled vaguely, stood up, and began to make his way once more towards the lagoon. The fat boy hung steadily at his shoulder. I expect there's a lot more of us scattered about. You haven't seen any others, have you? Ralph shook his head and increased his speed. Then he tripped over a branch and came down with a crash. The fat boy stood by him, breathing hard. My auntie told me not to run, he explained, on account of my asthma. Asthma? That's right. Can't catch me breath. I was the only boy in our school what had asthma, said the fat boy, with a touch of pride. And I've been wearing specs since I was three. He took off his glasses and held them out to Ralph, blinking and smiling, and then started to wipe them against his grubby windbreaker. An expression of pain and inward concentration altered the pale contours of his face. He smeared the sweat from his cheeks and quickly adjusted the spectacles on his nose. Them fruit, 
He glanced round the scar. Them fruit, he said, I expect. He put on his glasses, waded away from Ralph, and crouched down among the tangled foliage. I'll be out again in just a minute. Ralph disentangled himself cautiously and stole away through the branches. In a few seconds the fat boy's grunts were behind him, and he was hurrying towards the screen that still lay between him and the lagoon. He climbed over a broken trunk and was out of the jungle. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light, and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass, torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees, scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. Behind this was the darkness of the forest proper, and the open space of the scar. Ralph stood, one hand against a grey trunk, and screwed up his eyes against the shimmering water. Out there, perhaps a mile away, the white surf flinked on a coral reef, and beyond that the open sea was dark blue. Within the irregular arc of coral, the lagoon was still as a mountain lake, blue of all shades and shadowy green and purple. The beach between the palm terrace and the water was a thin bow stave, endless apparently, for to Ralph's left the perspectives of palm and beach and water drew to a point at infinity, and always, almost invisible, was the heat. He jumped down from the terrace. The sand was thick over his black shoes, and the heat hit him. He became conscious of the weight of his clothes, kicked his shoes off fiercely, and ripped off each stocking with its elastic garter in a single movement. Then he leapt back on the terrace, pulled off his shirt, and stood there among the skull-like coconuts, with green shadows from the palms and the forest sliding over his skin. He undid the snake clasp of his belt, lugged off his shorts and pants, and stood there naked, looking at the dazzling beach and the water. He was old enough, twelve years and a few months, to have lost the prominent tummy of childhood, not yet old enough for adolescence to have made him awkward. You could see now that he might make a boxer, as far as width and heaviness of shoulders went, but there was a mildness about his mouth and eyes that proclaimed no devil. He patted the palm trunk softly, and, forced at last to believe in the reality of the island, laughed delightedly again, and stood on his head. He turned neatly onto his feet, jumped down to the beach, knelt, and swept a double armful of sand into a pile against his chest. Then he sat back and looked at the water with bright, excited eyes. Ralph! The fat boy lowered himself over the terrace, and sat down carefully, using the edge as a seat. I'm sorry I've been such a time. Them fruits. He wiped his glasses and adjusted them on his button nose. The frame had made a deep pink V on the bridge. He looked critically at Ralph's golden body, and then down at his own clothes. He laid a hand on the end of a zipper that extended down his chest. My auntie... Then he opened the zipper with decision and pulled the whole windbreaker over his head. There! Ralph looked at him sidelong and said nothing. I expect we'll want to know all their names, said the fat boy. I'll make a list. We ought to have a meeting. Ralph did not take the hint, so the fat boy was forced to continue. I don't care what they call me, he said confidentially, so long as they don't call me what they used to call me at school. Ralph was faintly interested. What was that? The fat boy glanced over his shoulder, then leaned towards Ralph. He whispered, They used to call me Piggy. Ralph shrieked with laughter. He jumped up. Piggy! Piggy! Ralph, please! Piggy clasped his hands in apprehension. I said I didn't want Piggy! Piggy! Ralph danced out into the hot air of the beach, and then returned as a fighter plane with wings swept back and machine-gunned Piggy. Shiao! He dived in the sand at Piggy's feet and lay there laughing. Piggy! <laughs> Piggy grinned reluctantly, pleased despite himself at even this much recognition. So long as you don't tell the others, 
Ralph giggled into the sand. The expression of pain and concentration returned to Piggy's face. Half a sec! He hastened back into the forest. Ralph stood up and trotted along to the right. Here the beach was interrupted abruptly by the square motif of the landscape. A great platform of pink granite thrust up uncompromisingly through forest and terrace and sand and lagoon to make a raised jetty four feet high. The top of this was covered with a thin layer of soil and coarse grass and shaded with young palm trees. There was not enough soil for them to grow to any height, and when they reached perhaps twenty feet they fell and dried, forming a criss-cross pattern of trunks very convenient to sit on. The palms that still stood made a green roof, covered on the underside with a quivering tangle of reflections from the lagoon. Ralph hauled himself onto this platform, noted the coolness and shade, shut one eye, and decided that the shadows on his body were really green. He picked his way to the seaward edge of the platform, and stood looking down into the water. It was clear to the bottom, and bright with the efflorescence of tropical weed and coral. A school of tiny glittering fish flicked hither and thither. Ralph spoke to himself, sounding the bass strings of delight. Wizzo! Beyond the platform there was more enchantment. Some act of God, a typhoon perhaps, or the storm that had accompanied his own arrival, had banked sand inside the lagoon so that there was a long deep pool in the beach with a high ledge of pink granite at the further end. Ralph had been deceived before now by the specious appearance of depth in a beach pool, and he approached this one preparing to be disappointed. But the island ran true to form and the incredible pool, which clearly was only invaded by the sea at high tide, was so deep at one end as to be dark green. Ralph inspected the whole thirty yards carefully, and then plunged in. The water was warmer than his blood, and he might have been swimming in a huge bath. Piggy appeared again, sat on the rocky ledge, and watched Ralph's green and white body enviously. You can't half swim. Piggy! Piggy took off his shoes and socks, ranged them carefully on the ledge, and tested the water with one toe. It's hot! What did you expect? I didn't expect nothing. My auntie sucks to your auntie. Ralph did a surface dive and swam underwater with his eyes open. The sandy edge of the pool loomed up like a hillside. He turned over, holding his nose, and a golden light danced and shattered just over his face. Piggy was looking determined, and began to take off his shorts. Presently he was palely and fatly naked. He tiptoed down the sandy side of the pool, and sat there up to his neck in water, smiling proudly at Ralph. "'Aren't you going to swim?' Piggy shook his head. "'I can't swim. I wasn't allowed. My asthma!' Sucks to your asthma! Piggy bore this with a sort of humble patience. You can't half swim well! Ralph paddled backwards down the slope, immersed his mouth, and blew a jet of water into the air. Then he lifted his chin and spoke. I could swim when I was five. Daddy taught me. He's a commander in the Navy. When he gets leave, he'll come and rescue us. What's your father? Piggy flushed suddenly. My dad's dead he said quickly. And my mum? He took off his glasses and looked vainly for something with which to clean them. I used to live with my auntie. She kept a sweet shop. I used to get ever so many sweets, as many as I liked. When will your dad rescue us? Soon as he can. Piggy rose dripping from the water and stood naked cleaning his glasses with a sock. The only sound that reached them now through the heat of the morning was the long, grinding roar of the breakers on the reef. How does he know we're here? Ralph lolled in the water. Sleep enveloped him like the swathing mirages that were wrestling with the brilliance of the lagoon. How does he know we're here? Because, thought Ralph, because, because. The roar from the reef became very distant. They'd tell him at the airport. Piggy shook his head, put on his flashing glasses, 
and looked down at Ralph. Not them. Didn't you hear what the pilot said about the atom bomb? They're all dead. Ralph pulled himself out of the water, stood facing Piggy, and considered this unusual problem. Piggy persisted. This is an island, isn't it? I climbed a rock, said Ralph slowly, and I think this is an island. They're all dead, said Piggy, and this is an island. Nobody don't know we're here. Your dad don't know? Nobody don't know. His lips quivered, and the spectacles were dimmed with mist. We may stay here till we die. With that word, the heat seemed to increase till it became a threatening weight, and the lagoon attacked them with a blinding effulgence. Get my clothes, muttered Ralph. Along there. He trotted through the sand, enduring the sun's enmity, crossed the platform and found his scattered clothes. To put on a grey shirt once more was strangely pleasing. Then he climbed the edge of the platform and sat in the green shade on a convenient trunk. Piggy hauled himself up, carrying most of his clothes under his arms. Then he sat carefully on a fallen trunk near the little cliff that fronted the lagoon and the tangled reflections quivered over him. Presently he spoke. We gotta find the others. We gotta do something. Ralph said nothing. Here was a coral island. Protected from the sun, ignoring Piggy's ill-omened talk, he dreamed pleasantly. Piggy insisted. How many of us are there? Ralph came forward and stood by Piggy. I don't know. Here and there little breezes crept over the polished waters beneath the haze of heat. When these breezes reached the platform, the palm fronds would whisper, so that spots of blurred sunlight slid over their bodies or moved like bright winged things in the shade. Piggy looked up at Ralph. All the shadows on Ralph's face were reversed, green above, bright below, from the lagoon. A blur of sunlight was crawling across his hair. We gotta do something. Ralph looked through him. Here at last was the imagined but never fully realized place leaping into real life. Ralph's lips parted in a delighted smile, and Piggy, taking this smile to himself as a mark of recognition, laughed with pleasure. <laughs> if it really is an island. What's that? Ralph had stopped smiling and was pointing into the lagoon. Something creamy lay among the ferny weeds. A stone? No, a shell. Suddenly Piggy was a bubble with decorous excitement. That's right, it's a shell. I've seen one like that before on someone's back wall. A conch, he called it. He used to blow it, and then his mum would come. It's ever so valuable. Near to Ralph's elbow, a palm sapling leaned out over the lagoon. Indeed, the weight was already pulling a lump from the poor soil, and soon it would fall. He tore out the stem and began to poke about in the water, while the brilliant fish flicked away on this side and that. Piggy leaned dangerously. Careful, you'll break it! Shut up! Ralph spoke absently. The shell was interesting and pretty and a worthy plaything, but the vivid phantoms of his daydream still interposed between him and Piggy, who in this context was an irrelevance. The palm sapling, bending, pushed the shell across the weeds. Ralph used one hand as a fulcrum and pressed down with the other till the shell rose, dripping, and Piggy could make a grab. Now the shell was no longer a thing seen but not to be touched, Ralph too became excited. Piggy babbled, A conch, ever so expensive. I bet if you wanted to buy one, you'd have to pay pounds and pounds and pounds. He had it on his garden wall. And my auntie... Ralph took the shell from Piggy, and a little water ran down his arm. In colour, the shell was deep cream, touched here and there with fading pink. Between the point, worn away into a little hole, and the pink lips of the mouth, lay eighteen inches of shell with a slight spiral twist and covered with a delicate, embossed pattern. Ralph shook sand out of the deep tube. Mood like a cow, said Piggy. He had some white stones, too, and a birdcage with a green parrot. He didn't blow the white stones, of course. And he said, 
Piggy paused for breath and stroked the glistening thing that lay in Ralph's hands. Ralph! Ralph looked up. We can use this to call the others. Have a meeting. They'll come when they hear us. He beamed at Ralph. That was what you meant, didn't you? That's why you got the conch out of the water? Ralph pushed back his fair hair. How did your friend blow the conch? He kind of spat, said Piggy. My auntie wouldn't let me blow on account of my asthma. You said you blew from down here. Piggy laid a hand on his jutting abdomen. You try, Ralph. You'll call the others. Doubtfully, Ralph laid the small end of the shell against his mouth and blew. There came a rushing sound from its mouth, but nothing more. Ralph wiped the salt water off his lips and tried again, but the shell remained silent. He kind of spat. Ralph pursed his lips and squirted air into the shell, which emitted a low farting noise. This amused both boys so much that Ralph went on squirting for some minutes between bouts of laughter. He blew from down here. Ralph grasped the idea and hit the shell with air from his diaphragm. Immediately the thing sounded. A deep, harsh note boomed under the palms, spread through the intricacies of the forest, and echoed back from the pink granite of the mountain. Clouds of birds rose from the treetops, and something squealed and ran in the undergrowth. Ralph took the shell away from his lips. Gosh! His ordinary voice sounded like a whisper after the harsh note of the conch. He laid the conch against his lips, took a deep breath, and blew once more. The note boomed again, and then, at his firmer pressure, the note fluking up an octave became a strident blare more penetrating than before. Piggy was shouting something, his face pleased, his glasses flashing. The birds cried, small animals scuttered. Ralph's breath failed. The note dropped the octave, became a low wobber was a rush of air. The conch was silent, a gleaming tusk. Ralph's face was dark with breathlessness, and the air over the island was full of bird clamour and echoes ringing. I bet you can hear that for miles. Ralph found his breath and blew a series of short blasts. Piggy exclaimed, There's one! A child had appeared among the palms about a hundred yards along the beach. He was a boy of perhaps six years, sturdy and fair, his clothes torn, his face covered with a sticky mess of fruit. His trousers had been lowered for an obvious purpose, and had only been pulled back halfway. He jumped off the palm terrace into the sand, and his trousers fell about his ankles. He stepped out of them and trotted to the platform. Piggy helped him up. Meanwhile Ralph continued to blow till voices shouted in the forest. The small boy squatted in front of Ralph, looking up brightly and vertically. As he received the assurance of something purposeful being done, he began to look satisfied, and his only clean digit, a pink thumb, slid into his mouth. Piggy leaned down to him. What's your name? Johnny. Piggy muttered the name to himself and shouted it to Ralph, who was not interested because he was still blowing. His face was dark with the violent pleasure of making this stupendous noise, and his heart was making the stretched shirt shake. The shouting in the forest was nearer. Signs of life were visible now on the beach. The sand, trembling beneath the heat haze, concealed many figures in its miles of length. Boys were making their way towards the platform through the hot, dumb sand. Three small children, no older than Johnny, appeared from startlingly close at hand where they'd been gorging fruit in the forest. A dark little boy, not much younger than Piggy, parted a tangle of undergrowth, walked onto the platform, and smiled cheerfully at everybody. More and more of them came. Taking their cue from the innocent Johnny, they sat down on the fallen palm trunks and waited. Ralph continued to blow short, penetrating blasts. Piggy moved among the crowd, asking names and frowning to remember them. The children gave him the same simple obedience that they had given to the men with megaphones. 
Some were naked and carrying their clothes, others half-naked or more or less dressed in school uniforms, grey, blue, fawn, jacketed or jerseyed. There were badges, mottos even, stripes of colour in stockings and pullovers. Their heads clustered above the trunks in the green shade, heads brown, fair, black, chestnut, sandy, mouse-coloured, heads muttering, whispering, heads full of eyes that watched Ralph and speculated. Something was being done. The children who came along the beach, singly or in twos, leapt into visibility when they crossed the line from heat haze to nearer sand. Here the eye was first attracted to a black bat-like creature that danced on the sand, and only later perceived the body above it. The bat was the child's shadow, shrunk by the vertical sun to a patch between the hurrying feet. Even while he blew, Ralph noticed the last pair of bodies that reached the platform above a fluttering patch of black. The two boys, bullet-headed and with hair like tow, flung themselves down and lay grinning and panting at Ralph like dogs. They were twins, and the eye was shocked and incredulous at such cheery duplication. They breathed together, they grinned together, they were chunky and vital. They raised wet lips at Ralph, for they seemed provided with not quite enough skin, so that their profiles were blurred and their mouths pulled open. Piggy bent his flashing glasses to them, and could be heard between the blasts repeating their names. Sam Eric, Sam Eric. Then he got muddled. The twins shook their heads and pointed at each other, and the crowd laughed. At last Ralph ceased to blow, and sat there, the conch trailing from one hand, his head bowed on his knees. As the echoes died away, so did the laughter, and there was silence. Within the diamond haze of the beach, something dark was fumbling along. Ralph saw it first, and watched till the intentness of his gaze drew all eyes that way. Then the creature stepped from mirage onto clear sand, and they saw that the darkness was not all shadow but mostly clothing. The creature was a party of boys marching approximately in step in two parallel lines and dressed in strangely eccentric clothing. Shorts, shirts, and different garments they carried in their hands, but each boy wore a square black cap with a silver badge in it. Their bodies, from throat to ankle, were hidden by black cloaks which bore a long silver cross on the left breast, and each neck was finished off with a ham-bone frill. The heat of the tropics, the descent, the search for food, and now this sweaty march along the blazing beach had given them the complexions of newly washed plums. The boy who controlled them was dressed in the same way, though his cap badge was golden. When his party was about ten yards from the platform, he shouted an order, and they halted, gasping, sweating, swaying in the fierce light. The boy himself came forward, vaulted onto the platform with his cloak flying, and peered into what to him was almost complete darkness. "'Where's the man with the trumpet?' Ralph, sensing his sunblindness, answered him. "'There's no man with the trumpet. Only me.' The boy came close and peered down at Ralph, screwing up his face as he did so. What he saw of the fair-haired boy with the creamy shell on his knees did not seem to satisfy him. He turned quickly, his black cloak circling. Isn't there a ship, then? Inside the floating cloak he was tall, thin, and bony, and his hair was red beneath the black cap. His face was crumpled and freckled, and ugly without silliness. Out of this face stared two light blue eyes, frustrated now, and turning, or ready to turn, to anger. Isn't there a man here? Ralph spoke to his back. No, we're having a meeting. Come and join in. The group of cloaked boys began to scatter from close line. The tall boy shouted at them. Qua, stand still! Wearily obedient, the choir huddled into line and stood there swaying in the sun. Nonetheless, some began to protest faintly. But Meridew, please, Meridew, can't we? 
Then one of the boys flopped on his face in the sand, and the line broke up. They heaved the fallen boy to the platform and let him lie. Mary Dew, his eyes staring, made the best of a bad job. All right, then. Sit down. Let him alone. But Mary Dew, he's always throwing a faint, said Mary Dew. He did in Jib and Addis and at Matins over the Presento. This last piece of sharp brought sniggers from the choir, who perched like black birds on the criss-cross trunks and examined Ralph with interest. Piggy asked no names. He was intimidated by this uniformed superiority and the off-hand authority in Mary Dew's voice. He shrank to the other side of Ralph and busied himself with his glasses. Mary Dew turned to Ralph. Aren't there any grown-ups? No. Mary Dew sat down on a trunk and looked round the circle. Then we'll have to look after ourselves. Secure on the other side of Ralph, Piggy spoke timidly. That's why Ralph made a meeting, so as we can decide what to do. We've heard names. That's Johnny. Those two, they're twins, Sam and Eric. Which, which is Eric, you? Uh, no, you're Sam. I'm Sam, and I'm Eric. We better all have names, said Ralph. So, I'm Ralph. We got most names, said Piggy. Got them just now. Kids' names, said Meridew. Why should I be Jack? I'm Meridew. Ralph turned to him quickly. This was the voice of one who knew his own mind. Then, went on Piggy, uh, uh, that boy, oh, I forget, you're talking too much, said Jack Meridew. Shut up, fatty. Laughter arose. He's not fatty, cried Ralph. His real name's Piggy. Piggy, Piggy, oh, Piggy. A storm of laughter arose, and even the tiniest child joined in. For the moment the boys were a closed circuit of sympathy with Piggy outside. He went very pink, bowed his head, and cleaned his glasses again. Finally the laughter died away, and the naming continued. There was Morris, next in size among the choir boys to Jack, but broad and grinning all the time. There was a slight furtive boy whom no one knew, who kept to himself with an inner intensity of avoidance and secrecy. He muttered that his name was Roger, and was silent again. Bill, Robert, Harold, Henry. The choir boy who had fainted sat up against a palm trunk, smiled pallidly at Ralph, and said that his name was Simon. Jack spoke. We've got to decide about being rescued. There was a buzz. One of the small boys, Henry, said that he wanted to go home. Shut up, said Ralph absently. He lifted the conch. Seems to me we ought to have a chief to decide things. A chief! A chief! I ought to be chief, said Jack with simple arrogance, because I'm chapter chorister and head boy. I can sing C-sharp. Another buzz. Well then, said Jack, I... He hesitated. The dark boy, Roger, stirred at last and spoke up. Let's have a vote. Yes! Vote for a chief! Let's vote! This toy of voting was almost as pleasing as the conch. Jack started to protest, but the clamour changed from the general wish for a chief to an election by acclaim of Ralph himself. None of the boys could have found good reason for this. What intelligence had been shown was traceable to Piggy, while the most obvious leader was Jack. But there was a stillness about Ralph as he sat that marked him out. There was his size and attractive appearance, and, most obscurely, yet most powerfully, there was the conch. The being that had blown that had sat waiting for them on the platform with the delicate thing balanced on his knees, was set apart. Him with the shell! Ralph! Ralph! Let him be chief with the trumpet thing! Ralph raised a hand for silence. All right. Who wants Jack for chief? With dreary obedience, the choir raised their hands. Who wants me? Every hand outside the choir, except Piggy's, was raised immediately. Then Piggy, too, raised his hand grudgingly into the air. Ralph counted. I'm chief, then. The circle of boys broke into applause. Even the choir applauded, and the freckles on Jack's face disappeared under a blush of mortification.
He started up, then changed his mind and sat down again while the air rang. Ralph looked at him, eager to offer something. The choir belongs to you, of course. They could be the army, or hunters. They could be... The suffusion drained away from Jack's face. Ralph waved again for silence. Jack's in charge of the choir. They can be... Uh, what do you want them to be? Hunters. Jack and Ralph smiled at each other with shy liking. The rest began to talk eagerly. Jack stood up. All right, choir. Take off your togs. As if released from class, the choir boys stood up, chattered, piled their black cloaks on the grass. Jack laid his on the trunk by Ralph. His grey shorts were sticking to him with sweat. Ralph glanced at them admiringly, and when Jack saw his glance, he explained, I tried to get over that hill to see if there was water all round, but your shell called us. Ralph smiled and held up the conch for silence. Listen, everybody, I've got to have time to think things out. I can't decide what to do straight off. If this isn't an island, we might be rescued straight away, so we've got to decide if this is an island. Everybody must stay round here and wait and not go away. Three of us, if we take more, we'd get all mixed and lose each other. Three of us will go on an expedition and find out. I'll go and Jack and... and... He looked round the circle of eager faces. There was no lack of boys to choose from. And Simon. The boys round Simon giggled, and he stood up laughing a little. Now that the pallor of his faint was over, he was a skinny, vivid little boy with a glance coming up from under a hut of straight hair that hung down black and coarse. He nodded at Ralph. I'll come. And I. Jack snatched from behind him a sizable sheath knife and clouted it into the trunk. The buzz rose and died away. Piggy stirred. I'll come. Ralph turned to him. You're no good on a job like this. All the same. We don't want you, said Jack flatly. Three's enough. Piggy's glasses flashed. I was with him when he found the conch. I was with him before anyone else was. Jack and the others paid no attention. There was a general dispersal. Ralph, Jack and Simon jumped off the platform and walked along the sand past the bathing pool. Piggy hung bumbling behind them. If Simon walks in the middle of us said Ralph, then we could talk over his head. The three of them fell into step. This meant that every now and then Simon had to do a double shuffle to catch up with the others. Presently Ralph stopped and turned back to Piggy. Look. Jack and Simon pretended to notice nothing. They walked on. You can't come. Piggy's glasses were misted again, this time with humiliation. You told them. After what I said... His face flushed. His mouth trembled. After I said I didn't want... What on earth are you talking about? About being called Piggy. I said I didn't care as long as they didn't call me Piggy. And I said not to tell, and then you went and said straight out. Stillness descended on them. Ralph, looking with more understanding at Piggy, saw that he was hurt and crushed. He hovered between the two courses of apology or further insult. Better piggy than fatty, he said at last, with the directness of genuine leadership. And anyway, I'm sorry if you feel like that. Now go back, piggy, and take names. That's your job. So long. He turned and raced after the other two. Piggy stood, and the rose of indignation faded slowly from his cheeks. He went back to the platform. The three boys walked briskly on the sand. The tide was low and there was a strip of weed-strewn beach that was almost as firm as a road. A kind of glamour was spread over them and the scene, and they were conscious of the glamour, and made happy by it. They turned to each other, laughing excitedly, talking, not listening. The air was bright. Ralph, faced by the task of translating all this into an explanation, stood on his head and fell over. When they had done laughing, Simon stroked Ralph's arm shyly, and they had to laugh again. Come on, said Jack presently. We're explorers. We'll go to the end of the island, said Ralph, and look round the corner, if it is an island. Now, towards the end of the afternoon, the mirages were settling a little. 
They found the end of the island quite distinct and not magicked out of shape or sense. There was a jumble of the usual squareness with one great block sitting out in the lagoon. Seabirds were nesting there. Like icing, said Ralph. On a pink cake. We shan't see round this corner, said Jack, because there isn't one, only a slow curve, and you can see the rocks get worse. Ralph shaded his eyes and followed the jagged outline of the crags up towards the mountain. This part of the beach was nearer the mountain than any other that they had seen. We'll try climbing the mountain from here, he said. I should think this is the easiest way. There's less of that jungly stuff and more pink rock. Come on. The three boys began to scramble up. Some unknown force had wrenched and shattered these cubes so that they lay askew, often piled diminishingly on each other. The most usual feature of the rock was a pink cliff surmounted by a skewed block, and that again surmounted, and that again, till the pinkness became a stack of balanced rock projecting through the looped fantasy of the forest creepers. Where the pink cliffs rose out of the ground, there were often narrow tracks winding upwards. They could edge along them deep in the plant world, their faces to the rock. What made this track? Jack paused, wiping the sweat from his face. Ralph stood by him, breathless. Men? Jack shook his head. Animals. Ralph peered into the darkness under the trees. The forest minutely vibrated. Come on. The difficulty was not the steep ascent round the shoulders of rock, but the occasional plunges through the undergrowth to get to the next path. Here the roots and stems of creepers were in such tangles that the boys had to thread through them like pliant needles. Their only guide, apart from the brown ground and occasional flashes of light through the foliage, was the tendency of slope. Whether this hole, laced as it was with cables of creeper, stood higher than that. Somehow they moved up. Immured in these tangles at perhaps their most difficult moment, Ralph turned with shining eyes to the others. Wacko! Wizard! Smashing! The cause of their pleasure was not obvious. All three were hot, dirty, and exhausted. Ralph was badly scratched. The creepers were as thick as their thighs and left little but tunnels for further penetration. Ralph shouted experimentally, and they listened to the muted echoes. "'This is real exploring,' said Jack. "'I bet nobody's been here before.' "'We ought to draw a map,' said Ralph. "'Only we haven't any paper. "'We could make scratches on bark,' said Simon, "'and rub black stuff in.' Again the solemn communion of shining eyes in the gloom. "'Wacko! Wizard!' There was no place for standing on one's head, this time, Ralph expressed the intensity of his emotion by pretending to knock Simon down, and soon they were a happy, heaving pile in the underdusk. When they had fallen apart, Ralph spoke first. Got to get on. The pink granite of the next cliff was further back from the creepers and trees, so that they could trot up the path. This again led into more open forest, so that they had a glimpse of the spread sea. With openness came the sun. It dried the sweat that had soaked their clothes in the dark, damp heat. At last, the way to the top looked like a scramble over pink rock, with no more plunging through darkness. The boys chose their way through defiles and over screes of sharp stone. Look! Look! High over this end of the island, the shattered rocks lifted up their stacks and chimneys, this one, against which Jack leaned, moved with a grating sound when they pushed. Come on! But not come on to the top. The assault on the summit must wait while the three boys accepted this challenge. The rock was as large as a small motor car. Heave! Sway back and forth, catch the rhythm. Heave! Increase the swing of the pendulum. Increase, come up and bear against that point of furthest balance. Increase, increase, heave. The great rock loitered, poised on one toe, decided not to return, moved through the air, fell, struck, turned over, leapt droning through the air, 
and smashed a deep hole in the canopy of the forest. Echoes and birds flew, white and pink dust floated, the forest further down shook as with the passage of an enraged monster. And then the island was still. Wacko! Like a bomb! Wee-yahoo! Not for five minutes could they drag themselves away from this triumph. But they left at last. The way to the top was easy after that. As they reached the last stretch, Ralph stopped. Golly! They were on the lip of a cirque, or a half-cirque, in the side of the mountain. This was filled with a blue flower, a rock plant of some sort, and the overflow hung down the vent and spilled lavishly among the canopy of the forest. The air was thick with butterflies, lifting, fluttering, settling. Beyond the cirque was the square top of the mountain, and soon they were standing on it. They had guessed before that this was an island, clambering among the pink rocks with the sea on either side and the crystal heights of air. They had known by some instinct that the sea lay on every side. But there seemed something more fitting in leaving the last word till they stood on the top and could see a circular horizon of water. Ralph turned to the others. This belongs to us. It was roughly boat-shaped, humped near this end, with behind them the jumbled descent to the shore. On either side, rocks, cliffs, treetops, and a steep slope. Forward there, the length of the boat, a tamer descent, tree-clad, with hints of pink. And then the jungly flat of the island, dense green, but drawn at the end to a pink tail. There, where the island petered out in water, was another island, a rock almost detached, standing like a fort facing them across the green with one bold pink bastion. The boys surveyed all this, then looked out to sea. They were high up, and the afternoon had advanced. The view was not robbed of sharpness by mirage. That's a reef, a coral reef. I've seen pictures like that. The reef enclosed more than one side of the island, lying perhaps a mile out, and parallel to what they now thought of as their beach. The coral was scribbled in the sea, as though a giant had bent down to reproduce the shape of the island in a flowing chalk line, but tired before he had finished. Inside was peacock water, rocks and weed showing as in an aquarium. Outside was the dark blue of the sea. The tide was running, so that long streaks of foam tailed away from the reef, and for a moment they felt that the boat was moving steadily astern. Jack pointed down. That's where we landed. Beyond falls and cliffs, there was a gash visible in the trees. There were the splintered trunks, and then the drag, leaving only a fringe of palm between the scar and the sea. There, too, jutting into the lagoon, was the platform, with insect-like figures moving near it. Ralph sketched a twining line from the bald spot on which they stood, down a slope, a gully, through flowers, round, and down to the rock where the scar started. That's the quickest way back. Eyes shining, mouths open, triumphant, they savoured the right of domination. They were lifted up were friends. There's no village smoke, and no boats, said Ralph wisely. We'll make sure later, but I think it's uninhabited. We'll get food, cried Jack. Can't catch things until they fetch us. Simon looked at them both, saying nothing, but nodding till his black hair flopped backwards and forwards. His face was glowing. Ralph looked down the other way, where there was no reef. Steeper, said Jack. Ralph made a cupping gesture. That bit of forest down there, the mountain holds it up. Every coin of the mountain held up trees, flowers and trees. Now the forest stirred, roared, flailed. The nearest acres of rock flowers fluttered, and for half a minute the breeze blew cool on their faces. Ralph spread his arms. All... Ours. 
They laughed and tumbled and shouted on the mountain. I'm hungry. When Simon mentioned his hunger, the others became aware of theirs. Come on, said Ralph. We found out what we wanted to know. They scrambled down a rock slope, dropped among flowers, and made their way under the trees. Here they paused and examined the bushes around them curiously. Simon spoke first. Like candles. Candle bushes. Candle buds. The bushes were dark evergreen and aromatic, and the many buds were waxen green and folded up against the light. Jack slashed at one with his knife, and the scent spilled over them. Candle buds? You couldn't light them, said Ralph. They just looked like candles. Green candles, said Jack contemptuously. We can't eat them. Come on. They were in the beginnings of the thick forest, plonking with weary feet on a track, when they heard the noises, squeakings, and the hard strike of hoofs on a path. As they pushed forward, the squeaking increased till it became a frenzy. They found a piglet caught in a curtain of creepers, throwing itself at the elastic traces in all the madness of extreme terror. Its voice was thin, needle-sharp, and insistent. The three boys rushed forward, and Jack drew his knife again with a flourish. He raised his arm in the air. There came a pause, a hiatus. The pig continued to scream and the creepers to jerk, and the blade continued to flash at the end of a bony arm. The pause was only long enough for them to realize what an enormity the downward stroke would be. Then the piglet tore loose from the creepers and scurried into the undergrowth. They were left looking at each other and the place of terror. Jack's face was white under the freckles. He noticed that he still held the knife aloft and brought his arm down, replacing the blade in the sheath. Then they all three laughed ashamedly and began to climb back to the track. I was choosing a place, said Jack. I was just waiting for a moment to decide where to stab him. You should stick a pig, said Ralph fiercely. They always talk about sticking a pig. You cut a pig's throat to let the blood out, said Jack. Otherwise you can't eat the meat. Why didn't you? They knew very well why he hadn't, because of the enormity of the knife descending and cutting into living flesh, because of the unbearable blood. I was going to, said Jack. He was ahead of them, and they could not see his face. I was choosing a place. Next time, he snatched his knife out of the sheath and slammed it into a tree trunk. Next time there would be no mercy. He looked round, fiercely daring them to contradict. Then they broke out into the sunlight, and for a while they were busy finding and devouring food as they moved down the scar towards the platform and the meeting. Chapter 2 Fire on the Mountain by the time Ralph finished blowing the conch, the platform was crowded. There were differences between this meeting and the one held in the morning. The afternoon sun slanted in from the other side of the platform, and most of the children, feeling too late the smart of sunburn, had put their clothes on. The choir, noticeably less of a group, had discarded their cloaks. Ralph sat on a fallen trunk, his left side to the sun. On his right were most of the choir. On his left, the larger boys who had known each other before the evacuation. Before him, small children squatted in the grass. Silence now. Ralph lifted the cream and pink shell to his knees, and a sudden breeze scattered light over the platform. He was uncertain whether to stand up or remain sitting. He looked sideways to his left, towards the bathing pool. Piggy was sitting near, but giving no help. Ralph cleared his throat. Well, then. All at once he found he could talk fluently and explain what he had to say. He passed a hand through his fair hair and spoke. We're on an island. We've been on the mountaintop and seen water all round. 
We saw no houses, no smoke, no footprints, no boats, no people. We're on an uninhabited island with no other people on it. Jack broke in. All the same, you need an army for hunting. Hunting pigs. Yes, there are pigs on the island. All three of them tried to convey the sense of the pink, live thing struggling in the creepers. We saw squealing. It broke away before I could kill it, but next time... Jack slammed his knife into a trunk and looked round challengingly. The meeting settled down again. So, you see, said Ralph, we need hunters to get us meat. And another thing. He lifted the shell on his knees and looked round the sun-slashed faces. There aren't any grown-ups. We shall have to look after ourselves. The meeting hummed and was silent. And another thing. We can't have everybody talking at once. We'll have to have hands up like at school. He held the conch before his face and glanced round the mouth. Then I'll give him the conch. Conch? That's what this shell's called. I'll give the conch to the next person to speak. He can hold it when he's speaking. But look, and he won't be interrupted except by me. Jack was on his feet. We'll have rules he cried excitedly. Lots of rules. Then when anyone breaks them, wee-hoo, whack bong doink. Ralph felt the conch lifted from his lap. Then Piggy was standing cradling the great cream shell, and the shouting died down. Jack, left on his feet, looked uncertainly at Ralph, who smiled and patted the log. Jack sat down. Piggy took off his glasses and blinked at the assembly while he wiped them on his shirt. You're hindering Ralph. You're not letting him get to the most important thing. He paused effectively. Who knows we're here? Eh? They knew at the airport. The man with the trumpet thing. My dad. Piggy put on his glasses. Nobody knows where we are, said Piggy. He was paler than before and breathless. Perhaps they knew where we was going to, and perhaps not. But they don't know where we are, because we never got there. He gaped at them for a moment, then swayed and sat down. Ralph took the conch from his hands. That's what I was going to say, he went on. When you all, you all... He gazed at their intent faces. The plane was shot down in flames. Nobody knows where we are. We may be here a long time. The silence was so complete that they could hear the fetch and miss of Piggy's breathing. The sun slanted in and lay golden over half the platform. The breezes that on the lagoon had chased their tails like kittens were finding their way across the platform and into the forest. Ralph pushed back the tangle of fair hair that hung on his forehead. So we may be here a long time. Nobody said anything. He grinned suddenly. But this is a good island. We, Jack, Simon and me, we climbed the mountain. It's wizard. There's food and drink and rocks. Blue flowers. Piggy, partly recovered, pointed to the conch in Ralph's hands, and Jack and Simon fell silent. Ralph went on. While we're waiting, we can have a good time on this island. He gesticulated widely. It's like in a book. At once there was a clamour. Treasure Island! Swallows and Amazons! Coral Island! Ralph waved the conch. This is our island. It's a good island. Until the grown-ups come to fetch us, we'll have fun. Jack held out his hand for the conch. There's pigs, he said. There's food and bathing water in that little stream along there. And everything. Didn't anyone find anything else? He handed the conch back to Ralph and sat down. Apparently no one had found anything. The older boys first noticed the child when he resisted. There was a group of little boys urging him forward, and he did not want to go. He was a shrimp of a boy, about six years old, and one side of his face was blotted out by a mulberry-coloured birthmark. He stood now, warped out of the perpendicular by the fierce light of publicity, and he bored into the coarse grass with one toe. He was muttering and about to cry. 
The other little boys, whispering but serious, pushed him towards Ralph. All right, said Ralph. Come on, then. The small boy looked round in panic. Speak up. The small boy held out his hands for the conch, and the assembly shouted with laughter. At once he snatched back his hands and started to cry. Let him have the conch, shouted Piggy. Let him have it. At last Ralph induced him to hold the shell, but by then the blow of laughter had taken away the child's voice. Piggy knelt by him, one hand on the great shell, listening and interpreting to the assembly. He wants to know what you're going to do about the snake thing. Ralph laughed, and the other boys laughed with him. The small boy twisted further into himself. Tell us about the snake thing. Now he says it was a beastie. Beastie? A snake thing, ever so big, he saw it. Where? In the woods. Either the wandering breezes, or perhaps the decline of the sun, allowed a little coolness to lie under the trees. The boys felt it, and stirred restlessly. You couldn't have a beastie, a snake thing, on an island this size, Ralph explained kindly. You only get them in big countries like Africa or India. Murmur and the grave nodding of heads. He says the beastie came in the dark. Then he couldn't see it. Laughter and cheers. Did you hear that? Says he saw the thing in the dark. He still says he saw the beastie. It came and went away again and came back and wanted to eat him. He was dreaming. Laughing, Ralph looked for confirmation round the ring of faces. The older boys agreed, but here and there among the little ones was the dubiety that required more than rational assurance. He must have had a nightmare, stumbling about among all those creepers. More grave nodding. They knew about nightmares. He says he saw the beastie, the snake thing, and um, will it come back tonight? But there isn't a beastie. He says in the morning it turned into them things like ropes in the trees and hung in the branches. He says, will it come back tonight? But there isn't a beastie. There was no laughter at all now, and more grave watching. Ralph pushed both hands through his hair and looked at the little boy in mixed amusement and exasperation. Jack seized the conch. Ralph's right, of course. There isn't a snake thing. But if there was a snake, we'd hunt it and kill it. We're going to hunt pigs and get meat for everybody. And we'll look for the snake, too. But there isn't a snake. We'll make sure when we go hunting. Ralph was annoyed, and for the moment defeated. He felt himself facing something ungraspable. The eyes that looked so intently at him were without humour. But there isn't a beast. Something he had not known was there rose in him, and compelled him to make the point loudly and again. But I tell you, there isn't a beast. The assembly was silent. Ralph lifted the conch again, and his good humour came back as he thought of what he had to say next. Now we come to the most important thing. I've been thinking. I was thinking while we were climbing the mountain. He flashed a conspiratorial grin at the other two, and on the beach just now. This is what I thought. We want to have fun, and we want to be rescued. The passionate noise of agreement from the assembly hit him like a wave, and he lost his thread. He thought again. We want to be rescued, and of course we shall be rescued. Voices babbled. The simple statement, unbacked by any proof but the weight of Ralph's new authority, brought light and happiness. He had to wave the conch before he could make them hear him. My father is in the Navy. He said there aren't any unknown islands left. He says the Queen has a big room full of maps, and all the islands in the world are drawn there. So the Queen's got a picture of this island. Again came the sounds of cheerfulness and better heart. And sooner or later, a ship will put in here. It might even be Daddy's ship. So you see, sooner or later, we shall be rescued. He paused with the point made. The assembly was lifted towards safety by his words. They liked and now respected him. Spontaneously they began to clap, 
and presently the platform was loud with applause. Ralph flushed, looking sideways at Piggy's open admiration, and then the other way at Jack, who was smirking and showing that he too knew how to clap. Ralph waved the conch. Shut up! Wait! Listen! He went on in the silence, borne on his triumph. There's another thing. We can help them to find us. If a ship comes near the island, they may not notice us. So we must make smoke on top of the mountain. We must make a fire. A fire! Make a fire! At once half the boys were on their feet. Jack clambered among them, the conch forgotten. Come on, follow me! The space under the palm trees was full of noise and movement. Ralph was on his feet too, shouting for quiet, but no one heard him. All at once the crowd swayed towards the island and were gone following Jack. Even the tiny children went and did their best among the leaves and broken branches. Ralph was left holding the conch with no one but Piggy. Piggy's breathing was quite restored. Like kids, he said scornfully, acting like a crowd of kids. Ralph looked at him doubtfully and laid the conch on the tree trunk. I bet it's gone tea time, said Piggy. What do you think they're going to do on that mountain? He caressed the shell respectfully, then stopped and looked up. Ralph! Hey, where are you going? Ralph was already clambering over the first smashed swathes of the scar. A long way ahead of him was crashing and laughter. Piggy watched him in disgust. Like a crowd of kids! He sighed, bent, and laced up his shoes. The noise of the errant assembly faded up the mountain. Then, with the martyred expression of a parent who has to keep up with the senseless ebullience of the children, he picked up the conch, turned towards the forest, and began to pick his way over the tumbled scar. Below the other side of the mountain top was a platform of forest. Once more Ralph found himself making the cupping gesture. Down there we could get as much wood as we want. Jack nodded and pulled at his underlip. Starting perhaps a hundred feet below them, on the steeper side of the mountain, the patch might have been designed expressly for fuel. Trees, forced by the damp heat, found too little soil for full growth, fell early and decayed. Creepers cradled them, and new saplings searched a way up. Jack turned to the choir, who stood ready. Their black caps of maintenance were slid over one ear, like berries. We'll build a pile. Come on. They found the likeliest path down, and began tugging at the dead wood. And the small boys who had reached the top came sliding too, till everyone but Piggy was busy. Most of the wood was so rotten that when they pulled it, it broke up into a shower of fragments and wood lice and decay. But some trunks came out in one piece. The twins, Sam and Eric, were the first to get a likely log, but they could do nothing till Ralph, Jack, Simon, Roger and Morris found room for a handhold. Then they inched the grotesque dead thing up the rock and toppled it over on top. Each party of boys added a quota, less or more, and the pile grew. At the return, Ralph found himself alone on a limb with Jack, and they grinned at each other, sharing this burden. Once more, amid the breeze, the shouting, the slanting sunlight on the high mountain, was shed that glamour, that strange invisible light of friendship, adventure, and content. Almost too heavy. Jack grinned back. Not for the two of us. Together, joined in effort by the burden, they staggered up the last steep of the mountain. Together they chanted, one, two, three, and crashed the log onto the great pile. Then they stepped back, laughing with triumphant pleasure, so that immediately Ralph had to stand on his head. Below them, boys were still labouring, though some of the small ones had lost interest and were searching this new forest for fruit. Now the twins, with unsuspected intelligence, came up the mountain with armfuls of dried leaves and dumped them against the pile. One by one, as they sensed that the pile was complete, the boys stopped going back for more, 
and stood with the pink shattered top of the mountain around them. Breath came even by now, and sweat dried. Ralph and Jack looked at each other while society paused about them. The shameful knowledge grew in them, and they did not know how to begin confession. Ralph spoke first, crimson in the face. Will you? He cleared his throat and went on. Will you light the fire? Now the absurd situation was open, Jack blushed too. He began to mutter vaguely, You rub two sticks. You rub... He glanced at Ralph, who blurted out the last confession of incompetence. Has anyone got any matches? You make a bow and spin the arrow, said Roger. He rubbed his hands in mime. Psst! A little air was moving over the mountain. Piggy came with it in shorts and shirt, labouring cautiously out of the forest, with the evening sunlight gleaming from his glasses. He held the conch under his arm. Ralph shouted at him, Piggy, have you got any matches? The other boys took up the cry till the mountain rang. Piggy shook his head and came to the pile. My, you've made a big heap, haven't you? Jack pointed suddenly. His specs! Use them as burning glasses! Piggy was surrounded before he could back away. Here! Let me go! His voice rose to a shriek of terror as Jack snatched the glasses off his face. Find out! Give them back! I can hardly see! You'll break the conch! Ralph elbowed him to one side and knelt by the pile. Stand out of the light! There was pushing and pulling and officious cries. Ralph moved the lenses back and forth, this way and that, till a glossy white image of the declining sun lay on a piece of rotten wood. Almost at once, a thin trickle of smoke rose up and made him cough. Jack knelt too, and blew gently, so that the smoke drifted away, thickening, and a tiny flame appeared. The flame, nearly invisible at first in that bright sunlight, enveloped a small twig, grew, was enriched with colour, and reached up to a branch which exploded with a sharp crack. The flame flapped higher, and the boys broke into a cheer. My specs! howled Piggy. Give me my specs! Ralph stood away from the pile and put the glasses into Piggy's groping hands. His voice subsided to a mutter. Just blurs, that's all. Hardly see my hand. The boys were dancing. The pile was so rotten and now so tinder dry that whole limbs yielded passionately to the yellow flames that poured upwards and shook a great beard of flame twenty feet in the air. For yards round the fire the heat was like a blow, and the breeze was a river of sparks. Trunks crumbled to white dust. Ralph shouted, More wood! All of you get more wood! Life became a race with the fire, and the boys scattered through the upper forest. To keep a clean flag of flame flying on the mountain was the immediate end, and no one looked further. Even the smallest boys, unless fruit claimed them, brought little pieces of wood and threw them in. The air moved a little faster, and became a light wind, so that Leewood and Windward side were clearly differentiated. On one side the air was cool, but on the other the fire thrust out a savage arm of heat that crinkled hair on the instant. Boys who felt the evening wind on their damp faces paused to enjoy the freshness of it, and then found they were exhausted. They flung themselves down in the shadows that lay among the shattered rocks. The beard of flame diminished quickly, then the pile fell inwards with a soft, cindery sound, and sent a great tree of sparks upwards that leaned away and drifted downwind. The boys lay panting like dogs. Ralph raised his head off his forearms. That was no good. Roger spat efficiently into the hot dust. What do you mean? There wasn't any smoke, only flame. Piggy had settled himself in a coin between two rocks, and sat with a conch on his knees. We haven't made a fire, he said. What's any use? We couldn't keep a fire like that going, not if we tried. A fat lot you tried, said Jack contemptuously. You just sat. 
We used his specs, said Simon, smearing a black cheek with his forearm. He helped that way. I got the conch, said Piggy indignantly. You let me speak. The conch doesn't count on top of the mountain, said Jack, so you shut up. I got the conch in my hand. Put on green branches, said Morris. That's the best way to make smoke. I got the conch, Jack turned fiercely. You shut up. Piggy wilted. Ralph took the conch from him and looked round the circle of boys. We've got to have special people for looking after the fire. Any day there may be a ship out there. He waved his arm at the taut wire of the horizon. And if we have a signal going, they'll come and take us off. And another thing, we ought to have more rules. Where the conch is, that's a meeting. The same up here as down there. They assented. Piggy opened his mouth to speak, caught Jack's eye, and shut it again. Jack held out his hands for the conch and stood up, holding the delicate thing carefully in his sooty hands. I agree with Ralph. We've got to have rules and obey them. After all, we're not savages. We're English, and the English are best at everything. So we've got to do the right things. He turned to Ralph. Ralph, I'll split up the choir, my hunters, that is, into groups, and we'll be responsible for keeping the fire going. This generosity brought a spatter of applause from the boys, so that Jack grinned at them, then waved the conch for silence. We'll let the fire burn out now. Who would see smoke at night time anyway? And we can start the fire again whenever we like. Altos, you can keep the fire going this week, and Trebles the next. The assembly assented gravely. And we'll be responsible for keeping a lookout, too. If we see a ship out there, they followed the direction of his bony arm with their eyes, we'll put green branches on. Then there'll be more smoke. They gazed intently at the dense blue of the horizon, as if a little silhouette might appear there at any moment. The sun in the west was a drop of burning gold that slid nearer and nearer the sill of the world. All at once they were aware of the evening as the end of light and warmth. Roger took the conch and looked round at them gloomily. I've been watching the sea. There hasn't been the trace of a ship. Perhaps we'll never be rescued. A murmur rose and swept away. Ralph took back the conch. I said before we'll be rescued sometime. We've just got to wait, that's all. Daring, indignant Piggy took the conch. That's what I said. I said about our meetings and things, and then you said shut up. His voice lifted into the whine of virtuous recrimination. They stirred and began to shout him down. You said you wanted a small fire, and you've been and built a pile like a hayrick. If I say anything, cried Piggy with bitter realism, you say shut up. But if Jack or Morris or Simon... He paused in the tumult, standing, looking beyond them and down the unfriendly side of the mountain to the great patch where they had found dead wood. Then he laughed so strangely that they were hushed, looking at the flash of his spectacles in astonishment. They followed his gaze to find the sour joke. You got your small fire all right. Smoke was rising here and there among the creepers that festooned the dead or dying trees. As they watched, a flash of fire appeared at the root of one wisp, and then the smoke thickened. Small flames stirred at the bowl of a tree and crawled away through leaves and brushwood, dividing and increasing. One patch touched a tree trunk and scrambled up like a bright squirrel. The smoke increased, sifted, rolled outwards. The squirrel leapt on the wings of the wind and clung to another standing tree, eating downwards. Beneath the dark canopy of leaves and smoke, the fire laid hold on the forest and began to gnaw. Acres of black and yellow smoke rolled steadily towards the sea. At the sight of the flames and the irresistible course of the fire, the boys broke into shrill, excited cheering. The flames, as though they were a kind of wildlife, crept as a jaguar creeps on its belly towards a line of birch-like saplings that fledged an outcrop of the pink rock. They flapped at the first of the trees, and the branches grew a brief foliage of fire. 
The heart of flame leapt nimbly across the gap between the trees, and then went swinging and flaring along the whole row of them. Beneath the capering boys, a quarter of a mile square of forest was savage with smoke and flame. The separate noises of the fire merged into a drum roll that seemed to shake the mountain. You caught your small fire all right! Startled, Ralph realized that the boys were falling still and silent, feeling the beginnings of awe at the power set free below them. The knowledge and the awe made him savage. Oh, shut up! I got the conch, said Piggy in a hurt voice. I got a right to speak! They looked at him with eyes that lacked interest in what they saw, and cocked ears at the drum roll of the fire. Piggy glanced nervously into hell, and cradled the conch. We gotta let that burn out now, and that was our firewood. He licked his lips. There ain't nothing we can do. We ought to be more careful. I'm scared. Jack dragged his eyes away from the fire. You're always scared, yah, fatty. I got the conch, said Piggy bleakly. He turned to Ralph. I got the conch, ain't I, Ralph? Unwillingly, Ralph turned away from the splendid, awful sight. What's that? The conch. I got a right to speak. The twins giggled together. We wanted smoke. Now look. A pall stretched for miles away from the island. All the boys except Piggy started to giggle. Presently, they were shrieking with laughter. Piggy lost his temper. I got a conch. Just you listen. The first thing we ought to have made was shelters down there by the beach. Wasn't well, half cold down there in the night. But the first time Ralph says fire, you goes howling and screaming up this here mountain like a pack of kids. By now they were listening to the tirade. How can you expect to be rescued if you don't put first things first and act proper? He took off his glasses and made as if to put down the conch, but the sudden motion towards it of most of the older boys changed his mind. He tucked the shell under his arm and crouched back on a rock. Then, when you get here, you build a bonfire that isn't no use. Now you've been and set the whole island on fire. Won't we look funny if the whole island burns up? Cooked fruit, that's what we'll have to eat, and roast pork, and that's nothing to laugh at. You said Ralph was chief, and you don't give him time to think. And when he says something, you rush off like... like... He paused for breath, and the fire growled at them. And that's not all. Them kids, the little uns, who took any notice of them? Who knows how many we got? Ralph took a sudden step forward. I told you to. I told you to get a list of names. How could I? cried Piggy indignantly, all by myself. They waited for two minutes, then they fell in the sea. They went into the forest. They just scattered everywhere. How was I to know which was which? Ralph licked his pale lips. Then you don't know how many of us there ought to be? How could I with them little ones running round like insects? Then when you three came back, as soon as you said make a fire, they all ran away, and I never had a chance. That's enough said Ralph sharply, and snatched back the conch. If you didn't, you didn't. Then you come up here and pinch my specs. Jack turned on him. You shut up. And them little ones was wandering about down there where the fire is. How'd you know they aren't still there? Piggy stood up and pointed to the smoke and flames. A murmur rose among the boys and died away. Something strange was happening to Piggy. He was gasping for breath. Uh, little and gasped Piggy. Him with the mark on his face. I don't see him. Where is he now? The crowd was as silent as death. Him that talked about the snakes. He was down there. A tree exploded in the fire like a bomb. Tall swathes of creepers rose for a moment into view, agonized, and went down again. The little boys screamed at them, Snakes! Snakes! Look at the snakes! In the west and unheeded, the sun lay only an inch or two above the sea. Their faces were lit redly from beneath. Piggy fell against a rock. 
and clutched it with both hands. There, little and had a mark on his face. Where is he? He now. I tell you, I don't see him. The boys looked at each other fearfully, unbelieving. Where is he now? Ralph muttered the reply, as if in shame. Perhaps he went back to the... the... Beneath them, on the unfriendly side of the mountain, the drum roll continued. Chapter 3 Huts on the Beach Jack was bent double. He was down like a sprinter, his nose only a few inches from the humid earth. The tree trunks and the creepers that festooned them lost themselves in a green dusk thirty feet above him, and all about was the undergrowth. There was only the faintest indication of a trail here, a cracked twig and what might be the impression of one side of a hoof. He lowered his chin and stared at the traces as though he would force them to speak to him. Then, dog-like, uncomfortably on all fours, yet unheeding his discomfort, he stole forward five yards and stopped. Here was a loop of creeper with a tendril pendant from a node. The tendril was polished on the underside. Pigs passing through the loop brushed it with their bristly hide. Jack crouched with his face a few inches from this clue, then stared forward into the semi-darkness of the undergrowth. His sandy hair, considerably longer than it had been when they dropped in, was lighter now, and his bare back was a mass of dark freckles and peeling sunburn. A sharpened stick about five feet long trailed from his right hand, and except for a pair of tattered shorts held up by his knife belt, he was naked. He closed his eyes, raised his head and breathed in gently with flared nostrils, assessing the current of warm air for information. The forest and he were very still. At length he let out his breath in a long sigh and opened his eyes. They were bright blue, eyes that in this frustration seemed bolting and nearly mad. He passed his tongue across dry lips and scanned the uncommunicative forest. Then again he stole forward and cast this way and that over the ground. The silence of the forest was more oppressive than the heat, and at this hour of the day there was not even the whine of insects. Only when Jack himself roused a gaudy bird from a primitive nest of sticks was the silence shattered, and echoes set ringing by a harsh cry that seemed to come out of the abyss of ages. Jack himself shrank at this cry with a hiss of indrawn breath, and for a minute became less a hunter than a furtive thing, ape-like, among the tangle of trees. Then the trail, the frustration, claimed him again, and he searched the ground avidly. By the bowl of a vast tree that grew pale flowers on a grey trunk, he checked, closed his eyes, and once more drew in the warm air and this time his breath came short. There was even a passing pallor in his face, and then the surge of blood again. He passed like a shadow under the darkness of the tree, and crouched, looking down at the trodden ground at his feet. The droppings were warm. They lay piled among turned earth. They were olive green, smooth, and they steamed a little. Jack lifted his head, and stared at the inscrutable masses of creeper that lay across the trail. Then he raised his spear and sneaked forward. Beyond the creeper, the trail joined a pig run that was wide enough and trodden enough to be a path. The ground was hardened by an accustomed tread, and as Jack rose to his full height he heard something moving on it. He swung back his right arm and hurled the spear with all his strength. From the pig run came the quick, hard patter of hoofs, a castanet sound, seductive, maddening, the promise of meat. He rushed out of the undergrowth and snatched up his spear. The pattering of pig's trotters died away in the distance. Jack stood there, streaming with sweat, streaked with brown earth, stained by all the vicissitudes of a day's hunting. 
Swearing, he turned off the trail and pushed his way through until the forest opened a little, and instead of bald trunks supporting a dark roof, there were light grey trunks and crowns of feathery palm. Beyond these was the glitter of the sea, and he could hear voices. Ralph was standing by a contraption of palm trunks and leaves, a rude shelter that faced the lagoon and seemed very near to falling down. He did not notice when Jack spoke. Got any water? Ralph looked up, frowning from the complication of leaves. He did not notice Jack even when he saw him. I said, have you got any water? I'm thirsty. Ralph withdrew his attention from the shelter and realised Jack with a start. Oh, hello. Water. There by the tree. Ought to be some left. Jack took up a coconut shell that brimmed with fresh water from among a group that were arranged in the shade, and drank. The water splashed over his chin and neck and chest. He breathed noisily when he had finished. Needed that. Simon spoke from inside the shelter. Up a bit. Ralph turned to the shelter and lifted a branch with a whole tiling of leaves. The leaves came apart and fluttered down. Simon's contrite face appeared in the hole. Sorry. Ralph surveyed the wreck with distaste. Never get it done. He flung himself down at Jack's feet. Simon remained looking out of the hole in the shelter. Once down, Ralph explained, Been working for days now. And look. Two shelters were in position, but shaky. This one was a ruin. And they keep running off. You remember the meeting? How everyone was going to work hard until the shelters were finished? Except me and my hunters. Except the hunters. Well, the Lithlands are... He gesticulated, sought for a word. They're hopeless. The older ones aren't much better. Do you see? All day I've been working with Simon, no one else. They're off bathing or eating or playing. Simon poked his head out carefully. Your chief, you tell him off. Ralph lay flat and looked up at the palm trees and the sky. Meetings. Don't we love meetings? Every day, twice a day, we talk. He got on one elbow. I bet if I blew the conch this minute they'd come running. Then we'd be, you know, very solemn, and someone would say we ought to build a jet or a submarine or a TV set. When the meeting was over, they worked for five minutes, then wander off or go hunting. Jack flushed. We want meat. Well, we haven't got any yet, and we want shelters. Besides, the rest of your hunters came back hours ago. They've been swimming. I went on, said Jack. I let them go. I had to go on. I... He tried to convey the compulsion to track down and kill that was swallowing him up. I went on. I thought, by myself... The madness came into his eyes again. I thought I might kill. But you didn't. I thought I might. Some hidden passion vibrated in Ralph's voice. But you haven't yet. His invitation might have passed as casual, were it not for the undertone. You wouldn't care to help with the shelters, I suppose? We want meat, and we don't get it. Now the antagonism was audible. But I shall, next time. I've got to get a barb on this spear. We wounded a pig and the spear fell out. If we could only make barbs, we need shelters. Suddenly Jack shouted in rage, Are you accusing? All I'm saying is, we've worked dashed hard. That's all. They were both red in the face and found looking at each other difficult. Ralph rolled on his stomach and began to play with the grass. If it rains like when we dropped in, we'll need shelters all right. And then another thing, we need shelters because of the... He paused for a moment and they both pushed their anger away. Then he went on with the safe, changed subject. You've noticed, haven't you? Jack put down his spear and squatted. Notice what? Well, they're frightened. He rolled over and peered into Jack's fierce, dirty face. I mean the way things are. They dream. You can hear them. Have you been awake at night? Jack shook his head. They talk 
and screamed the little uns, even some of the others, as if, as if it wasn't a good island. Astonished at the interruption, they looked up at Simon's serious face. As if, said Simon, the beastie, the beastie or the snake thing was real. Remember? The two older boys flinched when they heard the shameful syllable. Snakes were not mentioned now, were not mentionable. As if this wasn't a good island, said Ralph slowly. Yes, that's right. Jack sat up and stretched out his legs. They're batty. Crackers. Remember when we went exploring? They grinned at each other, remembering the glamour of the first day. Ralph went on. So we need shelters as a sort of home. That's right. Jack drew up his legs, clasped his knees, and frowned in an effort to attain clarity. All the same, in the forest... I mean, when you're hunting, not when you're getting fruit, of course, but when you're on your own. He paused for a moment, not sure if Ralph would take him seriously. Go on. If you're hunting, sometimes you catch yourself feeling as if... He flushed suddenly. There's nothing in it, of course, just a feeling. But you can feel as if you're not hunting, but being hunted. As if something's behind you all the time in the jungle. They were silent again, Simon intent, Ralph incredulous and faintly indignant. He sat up, rubbing one shoulder with a dirty hand. Well, I don't know. Jack leapt to his feet and spoke very quickly. That's how you can feel in the forest. Of course, there's nothing in it, only, only... He took a few rapid steps towards the beach, then came back. Only I know how they feel. See? That's all. The best thing we can do is get ourselves rescued. Jack had to think for a moment before he could remember what rescue was. Rescue? Yes, of course. All the same, I'd like to catch a pig first. He snatched up his spear and dashed it into the ground. The opaque, mad look came into his eyes again. Ralph looked at him critically through his tangle of fair hair. So long as your hunters remember the fire, you and your fire. The two boys trotted down the beach and, turning at the water's edge, looked back at the pink mountain. The trickle of smoke sketched a chalky line up the solid blue of the sky, wavered high up, and faded. Ralph frowned. I wonder how far off you could see that. Miles. We don't make enough smoke. The bottom part of the trickle, as though conscious of their gaze, thickened to a creamy blur which crept up the feeble column. They've put on green branches muttered Ralph. I wonder. He screwed up his eyes and swung round to search the horizon. Got it! Jack shouted so loudly that Ralph jumped. What? Where? Is it a ship? But Jack was pointing to the high declivities that led down from the mountain to the flatter part of the island. Of course! They'll lie up there, they must do, and the sun's too hot. Ralph gazed, bewildered at his rapt face. They get up high, high up and in the shade, resting during the heat like cows at home. I thought you saw a ship. We could steal up on one, paint our faces so they wouldn't see, perhaps surround them, and then... Indignation took away Ralph's control. I was talking about smoke. Don't you want to be rescued? All you can talk about is pig, pig, pig. But we want meat, and I work all day with nothing but Simon, and you come back and don't even notice the hearts. I was working too. But you like it, shouted Ralph. You want to hunt, while I... They faced each other on the bright beach, astonished at the rub of feeling. Ralph looked away first, pretending interest in a group of little uns on the sand. From beyond the platform came the shouting of the hunters in the swimming pool. On the end of the platform, Piggy was lying flat, looking down into the brilliant water. People don't help much. He wanted to explain how people were never quite what you thought they were. Simon, he helps. He pointed at the shelters. All the rest rushed off. He's done as much as I have, only, well, Simon's always about. Ralph started back to the shelters with Jack by his side. Do a bit for you muttered Jack. 
Before I have a bathe. Don't bother. But when they reached the shelters, Simon was not to be seen. Ralph put his head in the hole, withdrew it, and turned to Jack. He's buzzed off. Got fed up, said Jack, and gone for a bathe. Ralph frowned. He's queer. He's funny. Jack nodded, as much for the sake of agreeing as anything, and by tacit consent they left the shelter and went towards the bathing pool. And then, said Jack, when I've had a bathe and something to eat, I'll just trek over to the other side of the mountain and see if I can see any traces. Coming? But the sun's nearly set. I might have time. They walked along, two continents of experience and feeling, unable to communicate. If I could only get a pig, I'll come back and go on with the shelter. They looked at each other, baffled, in love and hate. All the warm salt water of the bathing pool and the shouting and splashing and laughing were only just sufficient to bring them together again. Simon, whom they expected to find there, was not in the bathing pool. When the other two had trotted down the beach to look back at the mountain, he had followed them for a few yards, and then stopped. He had stood frowning down at a pile of sand on the beach where somebody had been trying to build a little house or hut. Then he turned his back on this, and walked into the forest with an air of purpose. He was a small, skinny boy, his chin pointed, and his eyes so bright they had deceived Ralph into thinking him delightfully gay and wicked. The coarse mop of black hair was long and swung down, almost concealing a low, broad forehead. He wore the remains of shorts, and his feet were bare like Jack's. Always darkish in colour, Simon was burned by the sun to a deep tan that glistened with sweat. He picked his way up the scar, past the great rock where Ralph had climbed on the first morning, then turned off to his right among the trees. He walked with an accustomed tread through the acres of fruit trees, where the least energetic could find an easy, if unsatisfying, meal. Flower and fruit grew together on the same tree, and everywhere was the scent of ripeness and the booming of a million bees at pasture. Here the Littlands, who had run after him, caught up with him. They talked, cried out unintelligibly, lugged him towards the trees. Then, amid the roar of bees in the afternoon sunlight, Simon found for them the fruit they could not reach, pulled off the choicest from up in the foliage, passed them back down to the endless, outstretched hands. When he had satisfied them, he paused and looked round. The little ones watched him inscrutably over double handfuls of ripe fruit. Simon turned away from them, and went where the just perceptible path led him. Soon high jungle closed in. Tall trunks bore unexpected pale flowers all the way up the dark canopy, where life went on clamorously. The air here was dark, too, and the creepers dropped their ropes like the rigging of foundered ships. His feet left prints in the soft soil, and the creepers shivered throughout their lengths when he bumped them. He came at last, to a place where more sunshine fell. Since they had not so far to go for light, the creepers had woven a great mat that hung at the side of an open space in the jungle, for here a patch of rock came close to the surface and would not allow more than little plants and ferns to grow. The whole space was walled with dark aromatic bushes and was a bowl of heat and light. A great tree, fallen across one corner, leaned against the trees that still stood, and a rapid climber flaunted red and yellow sprays right to the top. Simon paused. He looked over his shoulder, as Jack had done at the close ways behind him, and glanced swiftly round to confirm that he was utterly alone. For a moment his movements were almost furtive. Then he bent down and wormed his way into the centre of the mat. The creepers and the bushes were so close that he left his sweat on them, and they pulled together behind him. When he was secure in the middle, he was in a little cabin screened off from the open space by a few leaves. He squatted down, parted the leaves, and looked out into the clearing. 
Nothing moved but a pair of gaudy butterflies that danced round each other in the hot air. Holding his breath, he cocked a critical ear at the sounds of the island. Evening was advancing towards the island. The sounds of the bright fantastic birds, the bee sounds, even the crying of the gulls that were returning to their roosts among the square rocks, were fainter. The deep sea, breaking miles away on the reef, made an undertone less perceptible than the susurration of the blood. Simon dropped the screen of leaves back into place. The slope of the bars of honey-coloured sunlight decreased. They slid up the bushes, passed over the green candle-like buds, moved up towards the canopy, and darkness thickened under the trees. With the fading of the light, the riotous colours died, and the heat and the urgency cooled away. The candle buds stirred, their green sepals drew back a little, and the white tips of the flowers rose delicately to meet the open air. Now the sunlight had lifted clear of the open space and withdrawn from the sky. Darkness poured out, submerging the ways between the trees till they were dim and strange as the bottom of the sea. The candle buds opened, their wide white flowers glimmering under the light that pricked down from the first stars. Their scent spilled out into the air and took possession of the island. Chapter 4 Painted Faces and Long Hair The first rhythm that they became used to was the slow swing from dawn to quick dusk. They accepted the pleasures of morning, the bright sun, the whelming sea and sweet air, as a time when play was good and life so full that hope was not necessary and therefore forgotten. Towards noon, as the floods of light fell more nearly to the perpendicular, the stark colours of the morning were smoothed in pearl and opalescence, and the heat, as though the impending sun's height gave it momentum, became a blow that they ducked, running to the shade and lying there, perhaps even sleeping. Strange things happened at midday. The glittering sea rose up, moved apart in planes of blatant impossibility. The coral reef and the few stunted palms that clung to the more elevated parts would float up into the sky, would quiver, be plucked apart, run like raindrops on a wire, or be repeated as in an odd succession of mirrors. Sometimes land loomed where there was no land, and flicked out like a bubble as the children watched. Piggy discounted all this learnedly as a mirage, and since no boy could reach even the reef over the stretch of water where the snapped sharks waited, they grew accustomed to these mysteries, and ignored them, just as they ignored the miraculous throbbing stars. At midday the illusions merged into the sky, and there the sun gazed down like an angry eye. Then, at the end of the afternoon, the mirage subsided, and the horizon became level and blue and clipped as the sun declined. That was another time of comparative coolness, but menaced by the coming of the dark. When the sun sank, darkness dropped on the island like an extinguisher, and soon the shelters were full of restlessness under the remote stars. Nevertheless, the northern European tradition of work, play, and food right through the day made it impossible for them to adjust themselves wholly to this new rhythm. The little and Percival had early crawled into a shelter and stayed there for two days, talking, singing, and crying, till they thought him batty, and were faintly amused. Ever since then he had been peaked, red-eyed, and miserable, a little un who played little, and cried often. The smaller boys were known now by the generic title of little uns. The decrease in size from Ralph down was gradual, and though there was a dubious region inhabited by Simon and Robert and Morris, nevertheless no one had any difficulty in recognising big uns at one end and little uns at the other. The undoubted little uns, those aged about six, led a quite distinct and at the same time intense life of their own. 
They ate most of the day, picking fruit where they could reach it, and not particular about ripeness and quality. They were used now to stomach aches and a sort of chronic diarrhoea. They suffered untold terrors in the dark, and huddled together for comfort. Apart from food and sleep, they found time for play, aimless and trivial, among the white sand by the bright water. They cried for their mothers much less often than might have been expected. They were very brown and filthily dirty. They obeyed the summons of the conch, partly because Ralph blew it, and he was big enough to be a link with the adult world of authority, and partly because they enjoyed the entertainment of the assemblies. But otherwise they seldom bothered with the big uns, and their passionately emotional and corporate life was their own. They had built castles in the sand at the bar of the little river. These castles were about one foot high, and were decorated with shells, withered flowers, and interesting stones. Round the castles was a complex of marks, tracks, walls, railway lines, that were of significance only if inspected with the eye at beach level. The Littlands played here, if not happily, at least with absorbed attention and often as many as three of them would play the same game together. Three were playing here now. Henry was the biggest of them. He was also a distant relative of that other boy whose mulberry-marked face had not been seen since the evening of the great fire. But he was not old enough to understand this, and if he had been told that the other boy had gone home in an aircraft, he would have accepted the statement without fuss or disbelief. Henry was a bit of a leader this afternoon, because the other two were Percival and Johnny, the smallest boys on the island. Percival was mouse-coloured, and had not been very attractive even to his mother. Johnny was well-built, with fair hair and a natural belligerence. Just now he was being obedient, because he was interested, and the three children, kneeling in the sand, were at peace. Roger and Morris came out of the forest. They were relieved from duty at the fire, and had come down for a swim. Roger led the way straight through the castles, kicking them over, burying the flowers, scattering the chosen stones. Morris followed, laughing, and added to the destruction. The three little ones paused in their game, and looked up. As it happened, the particular marks in which they were interested had not been touched, so they made no protest. Only Percival began to whimper with an eye full of sand, and Morris hurried away. In his other life, Morris had received chastisement for filling a younger eye with sand. Now, though there was no parent to let fall a heavy hand, Morris still felt the unease of wrongdoing. At the back of his mind formed the uncertain outlines of an excuse. He muttered something about a swim, and broke into a trot. Roger remained, watching the Littlands. He was not noticeably darker than when he had dropped in, but the shock of black hair down his nape and low on his forehead seemed to suit his gloomy face, and made what had seemed at first an unsociable remoteness into something forbidding. Percival finished his whimper and went on playing, for the tears had washed the sand away. Johnny watched him with china-blue eyes, then began to fling up sand in a shower, and presently Percival was crying again. When Henry tired of his play and wandered off along the beach, Roger followed him, keeping beneath the palms and drifting casually in the same direction. Henry walked at a distance from the palms and the shade because he was too young to keep himself out of the sun. He went down the beach and busied himself at the water's edge. The great Pacific tide was coming in, and every few seconds the relatively still water of the lagoon heaved forwards an inch. There were creatures that lived in this last fling of the sea, tiny transparencies that came questing in with the water over the hot, dry sand. With impalpable organs of sense, they examined this new field. Perhaps food had appeared where, the last incursion, there had been none. Bird droppings, insects perhaps, any of the strewn detritus of landward life. Like a myriad of tiny teeth in a saw, the transparencies came scavenging over the beach.
This was fascinating to Henry. He poked about with a bit of stick that itself was wave-worn and whitened and a vagrant, and tried to control the motions of the scavengers. He made little runnels that the tide filled and tried to crowd them with creatures. He became absorbed beyond mere happiness as he felt himself exercising control over living things. He talked to them, urging them, ordering them. Driven back by the tide, his footprints became bays in which they were trapped and gave him the illusion of mastery. He squatted on his hams at the water's edge, bowed, with a shock of hair falling over his forehead and past his eyes, and the afternoon sun emptied down invisible arrows. Roger waited, too. At first he had hidden behind a great palm bowl, but Henry's absorption with the transparencies was so obvious that at last he stood out in full view. He looked along the beach. Percival had gone off, crying, and Johnny was left in triumphant possession of the castles. He sat there crooning to himself and throwing sand at an imaginary Percival. Beyond him, Roger could see the platform and the glints of spray where Ralph and Simon and Piggy and Morris were diving in the pool. He listened carefully, but could only just hear them. A sudden breeze shook the fringe of palm trees so that the fronds tossed and fluttered. Sixty feet above Roger, a cluster of nuts, fibrous lumps as big as rugby balls, were loosed from their stems. They fell about him with a series of hard thumps, and he was not touched. Roger did not consider his escape, but looked from the nuts to Henry and back again. The subsoil beneath the palm trees was a raised beach, and generations of palms had worked loose in this the stones that had lain on the sands of another shore. Roger stooped, picked up a stone, aimed, and threw it at Henry, threw it to miss. The stone, that token of preposterous time, bounced five yards to Henry's right and fell in the water. Roger gathered a handful of stones and began to throw them. Yet there was a space round Henry, perhaps six yards in diameter, into which he dare not throw. Here, invisible yet strong, was the taboo of the old life. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and school and policemen and the law. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. Henry was surprised by the plopping sounds in the water. He abandoned the noiseless transparencies and pointed at the centre of the spreading rings like a setter. This side and that the stones fell, and Henry turned obediently, but always too late to see the stones in the air. At last he saw one, and laughed, looking for the friend who was teasing him. But Roger had whipped behind the palm bowl again, was leaning against it, breathing quickly, his eyelids fluttering. Then Henry lost interest in stones, and wandered off. Roger? Jack was standing under a tree about ten yards away. When Roger opened his eyes and saw him, a darker shadow crept beneath the swarthiness of his skin. But Jack noticed nothing. He was eager, impatient, beckoning so that Roger went to him. There was a pool at the end of the river, a tiny mere dammed back by sand and full of white water lilies and needle-like reeds. Here Sam and Eric were waiting, and Bill. Jack, concealed from the sun, knelt by the pool and opened the two large leaves that he carried. One of them contained white clay and the other red. By them lay a stick of charcoal brought down from the fire. Jack explained to Roger as he worked. They don't smell me, they see me, I think. Something pink under the trees. He smeared on the clay. If only I'd some green. He turned a half-concealed face up to Roger and answered the comprehension of his gaze. For hunting, like in the war, you know, dazzle paint, like things trying to look like something else. He twisted in the urgency of telling, like moths on a tree trunk. Roger understood and nodded gravely. The twins moved towards Jack and began to protest timidly about something. Jack waved them away. Shut up! 
He rubbed the charcoal stick between the patches of red and white on his face. No, you two come with me. He peered at his reflection and disliked it. He bent down, took up a double handful of lukewarm water, and rubbed the mess from his face. Freckles and sandy eyebrows appeared. Roger smiled unwillingly. You don't half look a mess. Jack planned his new face. He made one cheek and one eye socket white, then rubbed red over the other half of his face, and slashed a black bar of charcoal across from right ear to left jaw. He looked in the mirror for his reflection, but his breathing troubled the mirror. Sam Eric, get me a coconut, an empty one. He knelt, holding the shell of water. A rounded patch of sunlight fell on his face, and a brightness appeared in the depths of the water. He looked in astonishment, no longer at himself, but at an awesome stranger. He spilt the water and leapt to his feet, laughing excitedly. Beside the mirror, his sinewy body held up a mask that drew their eyes and appalled them. He began to dance, and his laughter became a bloodthirsty snarling. He capered towards Bill, and the mask was the thing on its own behind which Jack hid, liberated from shame and self-consciousness. The face of red and white and black swung through the air and jigged towards Bill. Bill started up laughing. Then suddenly he fell silent and blundered away through the bushes. Jack rushed towards the twins. The rest are making a line. Come on. But we come on. I'll creep up and stab. The mask compelled them. Ralph climbed out of the bathing pool and trotted up the beach and sat in the shade beneath the palms. His fair hair was plastered over his eyebrows, and he pushed it back. Simon was floating in the water and kicking with his feet, and Morris was practising diving. Piggy was mooning about, aimlessly picking up things and discarding them. The rock pools which so fascinated him were covered by the tide, and so he was without an interest until the tide went back. Presently, seeing Ralph under the palms, he came and sat by him. Piggy wore the remainders of a pair of shorts, his fat body was golden brown, and the glasses still flashed when he looked at anything. He was the only boy on the island whose hair never seemed to grow. The rest were shock-headed, but Piggy's hair still lay in wisps over his head, as though baldness were his natural state, and this imperfect covering would soon go like the velvet on a young stag's antlers. "'I've been thinking,' he said, "'about a clock. We could make a sundial. We could put a stick in the sand, and then—' The effort to express the mathematical processes involved was too great. He made a few passes instead. "'And an airplane and a TV set,' said Ralph sourly and a steam engine. Piggy shook his head. You have to have a lot of metal things for that, he said, and we haven't got no metal, but we've got a stick. Ralph turned and smiled involuntarily. Piggy was a bore. His fat, his asthma, and his matter-of-fact ideas were dull. But there was always a little pleasure to be got out of pulling his leg, even if one did it by accident. Piggy saw the smile, and misinterpreted it as friendliness. There had grown up, tacitly among the biggins, the opinion that Piggy was an outsider, not only by accent, which did not matter, but by fat and asthma and specks, and a certain disinclination for manual labour. Now, finding that something he had said made Ralph smile, he rejoiced, and pressed his advantage. "'We got a lot of sticks. We could have a sundial each.' Then we should know what the time was. A fat lot of good that would be. Well, you said you wanted things done so as we could be rescued. Oh, shut up. He leapt to his feet and trotted back to the pool, just as Morris did a rather poor dive. Ralph was glad of a chance to change the subject. He shouted as Morris came to the surface, Belly flop, belly flop. Morris flashed a smile at Ralph, who slid easily into the water. Of all the boys, he was the most at home there. 
but today, irked by the mention of rescue, the useless, footling mention of rescue, even the green depths of water and the shattered golden sun held no balm. Instead of remaining and playing, he swam with steady strokes under Simon and crawled out of the other side of the pool to lie there, sleek and streaming like a seal. Piggy, always clumsy, stood up and came to stand by him, so that Ralph rolled on his stomach and pretended not to see. The mirages had died away, and gloomily he ran his eye along the taut blue line of the horizon. The next moment he was on his feet and shouting, Smoke! Smoke! Simon tried to sit up in the water and got a mouthful. Morris, who'd been standing ready to dive, swayed back on his heels, made a bolt for the platform, then swerved back to the grass under the palms. There he started to pull on his tattered shorts to be ready for anything. Ralph stood, one hand holding back his hair, the other clenched. Simon was climbing out of the water. Piggy was rubbing his glasses on his shorts and squinting at the sea. Morris had got both legs through one leg of his shorts. Of all the boys, only Ralph was still. "'I can't see no smoke,' said Piggy, incredulously. "'I can't see no smoke, Ralph. Where is it?' Ralph said nothing. Now both his hands were clenched over his forehead, so that the fair hair was kept out of his eyes. He was leaning forward, and already the salt was whitening his body. "'Ralph, where's the ship?' Simon stood by, looking from Ralph to the horizon. Morris's trousers gave way with a sigh, and he abandoned them as a wreck, rushed towards the forest, and then came back again. The smoke was a tight little knot on the horizon, and was uncoiling slowly. Beneath the smoke was a dot that might be a funnel. Ralph's face was pale as he spoke to himself. They'll see our smoke. Piggy was looking in the right direction now. It don't look much. He turned round and peered up at the mountain. Ralph continued to watch the ship ravenously. Colour was coming back into his face. Simon stood by him, silent. I know I can't see very much, said Piggy. But have we got any smoke? Ralph moved impatiently, still watching the ship. The smoke on the mountain. Morris came running and stared out to sea. Both Simon and Piggy were looking up at the mountain. Piggy screwed up his face, but Simon cried out as though he had hurt himself. Ralph! Ralph! The quality of his speech slewed Ralph on the sand. You tell me, said Piggy anxiously. Is there a signal? Ralph looked back at the dispersing smoke on the horizon, then up at the mountain. Ralph, please! Is there a signal? Simon put out his hand timidly to touch Ralph, but Ralph started to run, splashing through the shallow end of the bathing pool, across the hot white sand and under the palms. A moment later he was battling with the complex undergrowth that was already engulfing the scar. Simon ran after him, then Morris. Piggy shouted, Ralph! Please, Ralph! Then he too started to run, stumbling over Morris's discarded shorts before he was across the terrace. Behind the four boys the smoke moved gently along the horizon, and on the beach Henry and Johnny were throwing sand at Percival, who was crying quietly again, and all three were in complete ignorance of the excitement. By the time Ralph had reached the landward end of the scar, he was using precious breath to swear he did desperate violence to his naked body among the rasping creepers so that blood was sliding over him. Just where the steep ascent to the mountain began, he stopped. Morris was only a few yards behind him. Piggy's specks, shouted Ralph. If the fire's right out, we'll need them. He stopped shouting and swayed on his feet. Piggy was only just visible bumbling up from the beach. Ralph looked at the horizon, then up to the mountain. Was it better to fetch Piggy's glasses, or would the ship have gone? Or, if they climbed on, supposing the fire was right out and they had to watch Piggy crawling nearer and the ship sinking under the horizon? Balanced on a high peak of need, agonised by indecision, Ralph cried out, Oh, God! Oh, God! 
Simon, struggling with bushes, caught his breath. His face was twisted. Ralph blundered on, savaging himself as the wisp of smoke moved on. The fire was dead. They saw that straight away, saw what they had really known down on the beach when the smoke of home had beckoned. The fire was right out, smokeless and dead. The watchers were gone. A pile of unused fuel lay ready. Ralph turned to the sea. The horizon stretched, impersonal once more, barren of all but the faintest trace of smoke. Ralph ran stumbling along the rocks, saved himself on the edge of the pink cliff, and screamed at the ship, Come back! Come back! He ran backwards and forwards along the cliff, his face always to the sea, and his voice rose insanely, Come back! Come back! Simon and Morris arrived. Ralph looked at them with unwinking eyes. Simon turned away, smearing the water from his cheeks. Ralph reached inside himself for the worst word he knew. They let the bloody fire out! He looked down the unfriendly side of the mountain. Piggy arrived out of breath and whimpering like a little un. Ralph clenched his fists and went very red. The intentness of his gaze, the bitterness of his voice pointed for him. There they are! A procession had appeared far down among the pink screes that lay near the water's edge. Some of the boys wore black caps, but otherwise they were almost naked. They lifted sticks in the air together whenever they came to an easy patch. They were chanting, something to do with the bundle that the errant twins carried so carefully. Ralph picked out Jack easily, even at that distance, tall, red-haired, and inevitably leading the procession. Simon looked now from Ralph to Jack, as he had looked from Ralph to the horizon, and what he saw seemed to make him afraid. Ralph said nothing more, but waited while the procession came nearer. The chant was audible, but at that distance still wordless. Behind Jack walked the twins carrying a great stake on their shoulders. The gutted carcass of a pig swung from the stake, swinging heavily as the twins toiled over the uneven ground. The pig's head hung down with gaping neck and seemed to search for something on the ground. At last the words of the chant floated up to them across the bowl of blackened wood and ashes. Kill the pig! Cut her throat! Spill her blood! Yet as the words became audible, the procession reached the steepest part of the mountain, and in a minute or two the chant had died away. Piggy snivelled, and Simon shushed him quickly as though he had spoken too loudly in church. Jack, his face smeared with clays, reached the top first, and hailed Ralph excitedly with lifted spear. Look! We've killed a pig! We stole up on them! We got in a circle! Voices broke from the hunters. We got in a circle! We crept up! The pig squealed! The twins stood with the pig swinging between them, dropping black gouts on the rock. They seemed to share one wide ecstatic grin. Jack had too many things to tell Ralph at once. Instead, he danced a step or two, then remembered his dignity, and stood still, grinning. He noticed blood on his hands, and grimaced distastefully, looked for something on which to clean them, then wiped them on his shorts, and laughed. Ralph spoke. You let the fire out. Jack checked, vaguely irritated by this irrelevance, but too happy to let it worry him. We can light the fire again. You should have been with us, Ralph. We had a smashing time. The twins got knocked over. We hit the pig. I fell on top. I cut the pig's throat, said Jack proudly, and yet twitched as he said it. Can I borrow yours, Ralph, to make a nick in the hilt? The boys chattered and danced. The twins continued to grin. There was lashings of blood, said Jack, laughing and shuddering. You should have seen it. We'll go hunting every day. Ralph spoke again, hoarsely. He had not moved. 
You let the fire out. This repetition made Jack uneasy. He looked at the twins and then back at Ralph. We had to have them in the hunt, he said, or there wouldn't have been enough for a ring. He flushed, conscious of a fault. The fire's only been out an hour or two. We can light up again. He noticed Ralph's scarred nakedness and the sombre silence of all four of them. He sought, charitable in his happiness, to include them in the thing that had happened. His mind was crowded with memories, memories of the knowledge that had come to them when they closed in on the struggling pig, knowledge that they had outwitted a living thing, imposed their will upon it, taken away its life like a long, satisfying drink. He spread his arms wide. You should have seen the blood. The hunters were more silent now, but at this they buzzed again. Ralph flung back his hair, one arm pointed at the empty horizon. His voice was loud and savage and struck them into silence. There was a ship!